books. If you haven't read it already, I would encourage you to go and read the declaration. It is one of the most poignant pieces, humble, honest pieces of writing I have seen on any organization's website about the things that we really do need to change in ourselves and the way we approach our work and the way our organizations need to rethink the way we are doing what we consider serving. So I'd really encourage you later, after you, after Heather is presented so that you don't get distracted from her presentation, but put a little pin in that. And after we're done today, go and read the declaration. And if you feel so led, if that speaks to your heart as something you want to be a part of, go ahead and sign that. Uh, it really is quite a moving piece. So I'm going to turn the platform over to Heather. She's going to be sharing her presentation. Thank you so much, Beth. I really appreciate that introduction. It makes me feel like very humble too. Um, but before I, I start talking about Bridgely specifically um, and how to support decolonization through Bridgely's approach to systematic implementation of our six pillars, I want to share a little bit about my story because this work is extremely personal for me. And um, God is amazing. And he's the author of hope and forgiveness and invention. And um, when there's been times in my life when I've wanted to shake my hands and honestly just walk away from the international nonprofit world, um, it's really God has been like, I don't think so, Heather. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Colorado. Um, for those of you that are international, that's right in the middle western uh, half of the United States. It's covered in mountains, and I'm a mountain girl. And when I was very young, my family was um, considered poor by American standards. And so um, when my mom first had me and my sister, she was a manager at a company and decided to um, not work to take care of us. Um, but my dad struggled to provide. And so during my early childhood, we were on food stamps and um, there was people in our church body that they also would come by our house and drop off groceries. And so uh, they would they would ring the doorbell or knock on the door and um, and there would be a bag of groceries when we would answer the door. And we often didn't know who that was, um, but we knew it was somebody within our, our church family. And I remember once when I was a kid too, that my mom, she had gotten this envelope of money and on it, it said, a little bird told me that you needed this. And I remember her tearing up and that uh, she was like, oh yeah, we've got bills that we need to pay and I don't know where the, the money's gonna come from. And so when we were in our time of financial need, um, the church really showed up for us and thankfully, there was also a government program, it was called WIC in the 1980s, that provided that type of assistance as well. But um, something that I really appreciated is that um, my mom, she, she taught me and my sister about uh, just all the different tenets of our faith from a very young age. She got like a series of books. I can still remember the pictures. Um, she's a very like systematic teacher. And... Um, and she taught us to be generous. And she said, it does not matter what uh, level of income you have, where you sit with your socioeconomic standing, God calls people from all backgrounds and all levels to be generous. And um, that always stuck with me. And um, when I was 13 years old and I had started babysitting, my mom, uh, she at that point actually was working at Compassion International and our family was doing was doing better. But um, she brought home this picture of a kid that needed to be sponsored. And she told me and my sister, okay, you're babysitting. So you have some income, you can support somebody in need. And it was like, and I don't remember it being an option. Um, and, but I didn't resent it either. It's like, okay, I guess we are now gonna support this child in the Dominican Republic. Um, throughout all of junior high and high school, and it was it, it was great. Um, 
But when I graduated out of college, I went right into the international nonprofit world. And um, the first organization I worked for, it was a nonprofit, non-sectarian humanitarian organization, so not faith-based. And um, within just a year of working there, they promoted me to being their executive director, and I was only 25 years old. Um, and so I was just trying to learn so much about the international nonprofit system because um, I was planning on going into nonprofits, but not leading one, being more a, a part of the team. And I honestly did not feel ready to lead a team at that point in my life. I was, I just, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but it was a great initial learning experience about just um, different systems um, outside of child sponsorship um, that are tackling uh, poverty. And so uh, I, I left there because I honestly didn't want to be the leader at that age uh, after a few years and went over to another organization. And um, they gave me the opportunity to restructure uh, their short-term missions department, which was really fun. Um, and I got to be like, hey, we're requiring training and we're going to teach people about dignity and that you're going to a program that God had already established and we are not going as the saviors and I was really passionate about everyone going through training and um but there was this struggle internally inside of me because we I constantly train about dignity but then I worked in an organization that was very similar to many um organizations across the the United States um and that work I think also in Europe that there's talk of let's give people dignity, let's um, have transparency, there's local heroes, and yet there's processes and systems in place that make us the brokers of those relationships. And so it made me uncomfortable because it was like, okay, yep, you can't, you can't, once you go on a team, you cannot stay in contact with those that you meet there. We're telling you be relational, but then at the same time, when you get home, all that relationship has to go through us because those are our donor dollars. And we want to make sure that they continue to go through us. And um, we also want to protect those frontline facilitators from those bad donors that are going to suggest things that would be inappropriate. And so there was, there was that struggle. And then also I had taken a group of people to Liberia and, um, it was a fully funded program. Every kid was sponsored. And just by the way, I, I've never worked for Compassion. I'm not talking about Compassion. Um, but they they were like, okay, Heather, this is a fully funded program. But when they were at the rock quarry that the children were at after being at their learning center, um, you could see all the kids' ribs and you could see their spine poking out. And you could just see that these kids were significantly malnourished. And they were like, Heather, where, where do the funds go? If, if this program's fully funded, um, why do the kids look like they do? And there's many reasons, like child-headed households and everything else. But it did make me start to question um, about money getting through the pipeline and how many, how much resources stay um, in the United States and don't leave our borders to get to where the donor dollar is intended to go. Um, and so I started to question that. And then there was also a control between having awesome locally led programs. Like Root is on this call today. She was a, or is a Guatemala director, brilliant woman. Business plans like crazy. Like she is just, she's amazing. And um, I would see like, okay, there's these wonderful long-term plans put in place. And then seeing a global program side that was like, you know what, those locally sourced water filters that you are able to get, that's not something we want you to use. We can get donations for soil water filters. So we insist that you use the ones we can get donations for, even though you found a local solution. And I was just like, I, I, don't, I don't think I can continue to do this work. Like there's too many um, struggles between what we say we do and that we want self-sustainability, we want to uplift local work, and yet the systems that exist don't really uphold what we're saying. And so I quit and I was never planning on returning to the nonprofit world. 
at all because I didn't want to be a broker of the relationship and the money anymore. And so I went back to school. I went to um, Purdue University, got certified in Lean Six Sigma, which is all about business architecture and process design. I am very analytical and, and um, just minded, yeah, in that way. And so, but as God would have it, I met Scott Todd and he had this vision and he um, challenged me and said, okay, Heather, you can be cynical or you can be a part of the solution. And um, it's really healed my heart to look at things that um, can be improved and be a part of that building process because I do love to build. And so um, this, this work in seeing ministries adopt new approaches that are um, a little challenging to a sector that is over a hundred years old. There's different models that have existed for a very long time um, is, is challenging but it's also really life-giving. And so um, let's talk about dignity and local first design because they are not new concepts. They've been around a very, very long time and neither is decolonization, not a new concept. All that decolonization means is that it is the undoing of colonialism. But today that term is being used to describe institutions loosening control of cultural, psychological, and economic resources of indigenous groups for the goal of achieving indigenous sovereignty. So to me, I'm like, that is sounds a whole lot like, okay, local first design, uplifting the local leader and enabling them to become self-sustaining or essentially like don't get in the way of them being self-sustaining. Um, and so I, I believe that there's just, there's many, not all, but nonprofit practitioners that they're really aiming to do that, that they want to see that, that local program be independent. Um, but we haven't had good definitions for, for people becoming independent or organizations being independent. And we haven't had a way to say, are we actually moving the needle in that direction? Like what are the, how do we show that we do what we say we do? And so with Bridgely, we've come up with six pillars and a systematic implementation for each one of them for this very purpose. I'm gonna get through the pillars and you're gonna be like, oh, these aren't new concepts, Heather. I'm like, I, I know, it's just, this is what the metrics are against. And, um, you'll probably be asking as I'm going through this, how do you make these pillars systematic? And it's really all about the structure. And so they live in a house, which is a platform, Bridgely has an app. It's not just an app, but it is has an app. Um, and we have designed these pillars to be fulfilled by specific roles. And so I will show those to you as well. So let me share my screen real quick. Okay, so Bridgely's Pillars. I'm gonna do this super, super, super fast. Um, so dignity, we empower work that puts people at the center of their own growth and development. Relationships, we facilitate relationships to change lives and connect communities to promote intercultural solidarity. Local first, we rally support toward locally initiated work because local ownership is the key to sustainability and local solutions are best to solve local challenges. And we require transparency as it creates both um, trust and accountability. So there's no hype, no spin, no hero narratives. I like to say for the longest time in the church world in side note, I've been married to a pastor for like 23 years. And so I just, I, I hear this all the time and I used to say it myself, we have to speak up for those that can't speak for themselves. You know, there's that verse in Proverbs. But today, with the technology we have, we can really just hand the microphone to those that already have a voice and let them speak for themselves. Um, and then next is listening. So featured organizations must listen systematically to those that they claim to serve. And there's a lot of organizations I've talked to that they don't do this, but... Um, capturing insights and feedback for continuous improvement. We wanna help you do that. And then 
The last one, decentralization holds all of these together. So we connect frontline groups. So frontline facilitators that are doing the program work directly to their supporters, which is eliminating archaic institutional structures to gain efficiency. Much more money is getting through the pipeline this way, and then also therefore impact. And so who are these people um, that Bridgely is created for? Um, we created five different personas. And just a second. Felicia Facilitator, she is our first customer. If the system doesn't work for her, it's not going to work at all. And so often systems are first created either by looking at how to, to get donor dollars or there's a, a organization that is serving both the front line and the supporters and you know they work on strategy. I've been actually on those strategy teams and saying, okay, how are we going to design the programs in order to reach this goal of ending extreme poverty? And so we look at it instead as that Felicia facilitator is that primary person um, that we are trying to reach and that she she's the person that represents the local program and we don't want to be her voice. She already has a voice. And so we give her access to the global stage, widening the leadership pool. And this access also creates transparency. It helps her maintain her dignity. We're not giving it to her. And it uplifts locally designed and led ministries. And she is connected directly to her supporters. And then also has the ability to create her funding requests um, that are campaigns, can be child sponsorship, doesn't need to be, it's more than child sponsorship capable. Um, and then also like the, the one-time campaigns if you're raising money, let's say for water filters. And then she can collaborate with subject experts. And then next we got Monty Mobilizer. So think of Monty as a church pastor. Maybe he's the missions pastor or he's uh, got a network. This can also of course be a she, anything can. Um, but he's gone on a, let's say on a mission trip and visited Felicia Facilitator. And he's like, wow, I really wanna mobilize my network to support Felicia's work. And so through this platform, he's able to invest in and support Felicia's ministry, mobilize his network, share that program impact and foster learning and growth and be able to do it in a 21st century method. And then next is Sally Supporter. So uh, we've done a lot of research shows other organizations and your typical supporter that's gonna support at like $40 a month um, and continuity giving is a middle-aged lady. Um, but of course supporters come from all levels of society and um, yeah, but this persona is based on on her and that she's wanting to connect to Felicia's work. She wants to donate her funds, see the impact of those funds, not get a newsletter once a quarter um, that is just, you know, it's, it's impersonal. Um, she wants to be communicating with Felicia facilitator in 21st century ways. Let's do video. Like let's, we all have access to social environments online. And, and but she also then wants to be able to share those causes that she cares about with her network. So if Felicia has shared something really impactful and awesome, then Sally's like, man, I wish I could share this with my, my, my network easily. Like, I don't wanna have to figure out some big campaign. And so we're, we're serving her. And then next is our Amy administrator. So she kind of helps bring things together in the background. Um, she supports Felicia Facilitator, she supports Monty Mobilizer, and is able to pull reports and um, analyze data. Our back end is, actually sits on Salesforce. And then lastly, we have Edgar Expert. So um, you can think of a LMS component where there are experts um, that come from organizations um, and also that Felicia Facilitator can be an expert as well. If she's said, my, the way that I've run my program is fantastic. We've seen a lot of success and I wanna share that with other people trying to learn. And so, um, 
yeah, just think of like an LMS component. So how, what does this look like? I'm gonna show you some wireframes real quick. So within Bridgely, um, we have a global community of organizations. And so people, individuals can join these organizations. They see their communities that they've joined. They can see causes that they support. And then they also see um, community posts that are taken from all different ministries. We, we don't white label or skin an app for other ministries. We want all ministries to be working towards um, ending extreme poverty together. And Bridgely is incubated inside of One Child Global. So One Child Global is a ministry that serves vulnerable children all over the world. And um, when we were first building Bridgely for One Child, Scott and I stepped back and we we're like, you know, Bridgely is going to be more than spon a sponsorship app. It's sponsorship capable. But we really want to bring um, inclusive disruption with us. We don't want to just only disrupt ourselves. Um, we want it to be an inclusive thing and let's, let's work together to do better. And so um, Bridgely is available for ministries that meet those six pillars that I went through. The six pillars are a way that we vet organizations. Um, and then also every feature in Bridgely is also vetted against those six pillars as well. And then organizations um, are also listed by the name of their organization. People can search by country if they have, let's say, an affinity for Kenya or a specifically um, community name. So what's a cause community? So cause community is set up by the organization that has partnered with Bridgely and um, they are able to either do um, reoccurring like sponsorship or initiatives and I'll show you what that looks like. But within this cause community, you've got that frontline facilitator. So they're able to share updates directly with everyone that has joined their community. Um, you've got the ambassador that is in there, that Monty mobilizer person that is telling his community, join this cause community. Hear directly from Felicia facilitator. And um, we're our church might go visit this location, but you don't necessarily have to travel there if you're not able to. You can still be connected to this ministry. Um, and then, yeah, it's easy to support if it's the child sponsorship. This is just an example here. Um, and then so far we find that almost 100% of people cover the processing services. So 100% of the donation goes to the ministry. Um, the next, this is a child sponsorship example. And in discussion, we, let's get, we can get beyond child sponsorship. But um, here's an example of a child actually that I sponsor. And, and I'm able to send pictures back and forth and video back and forth. She responds to me with videos and pictures that are sent by Felicia Facilitator. And so um, the child isn't in the app itself. We want to make sure that children are protected. And um, some of our communities are even set to private where you have to have a special way to get into that community because it, there can be sensitive context. Um, but it's, I was sponsoring a girl in, in Guatemala that, and I got a video from her where it just, it touched my heart so much where she was like, Heather, please pray for me because I have lost my quinceanera address and pray for me because, um, I have to tell my mom <laughs> and I was like, this is fantastic. Like it's a real person. It's a real relationship. It's healthy. Um, but it was, it's definitely that you also knew where your funds were going and, um, that she wasn't asking for money. She was asking for prayer because her mom's probably going to kill her. Um, so it was, it was just amazing, but also we do the initiative cause communities. So this one is based on health initiatives. So you could have clean water wells, hygiene training, people can give to that reoccurringly, but then works in the same way of having those updates and relationship back and forth between the ambassador and the frontline facilitator, and then including uh, Sally's supporter. 
And you might be saying like, how is this creating um, decolonization? And the, the hope here is that it's not just funded by the United States. And so with Bridgely, we enable there to be um, giving locally. So you can receive money from the US and we're building the process right now where um, people within the country can also give. And so from any level, they're able to, to give and engage. And my desire is that over time that these organizations are fully funded by their own countries and fully led by their own countries. Um, but we have to give them the tools in order to help them to get there. Thanks for that. Every time we talk about Bridgely, I learn something new, and I love that. Um, I'm going to start us off. There were a lot of questions that came up for me thinking about this through the lens of a leader of an organization. Um, but I'd love to hear, because I assume you know one child has been using it, it's not, the cases that you showed look like they were live cases. So what struggles have the ministries that have been using it um, encountered so far in using the platform? Like what, what are the main you know, sticking points? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the biggest struggle is actually the decentralization aspect. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought that it would be much easier to adopt um, but what we are learning is that the frontline facilitators, they are not used to communicating on their own behalf yeah. and so, or creating marketing plans. And so, um, yeah, there does need to be intentional training for those facilitators. Um, the great thing is, is that we are, we have videos that have been posted of like, Hey, here's just what's going on at the program. Sometimes, you know, it's like the camera's turned to the side. I mean, it's, it's real, it's raw. Um, but, and then in other, in other instances, um, when there's not an ambassador that really sees themselves as the ambassador for those facilitators, um, then it's, it can feel like the facilitator is having a conversation with themselves. And so it's intentionally designed to have a give and take between an ambassador, and that can be an organization. So in some of One Child's um, in instances, the organization of One Child is the is doing the ambassador role mm -hmm. and then uplifting their program um, directors and frontline facilitators in, yeah, on the frontline. And, and so there's got to be Monty a good- Monty Mobilizer was that ambassador role, correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah, What what kind of- pushback or you know challenges have you been hearing or are you even getting those conversations at this point because I think some of us on this call can also help be advocates to get you know conversations with other organizations on your behalf yes um yeah I'll speak first outside of one child because we do have 13 ministries using Bridgely um right now and about a thousand monthly givers but um so we don't have any organization that has put their entire ministry onto Bridgely. And I actually don't encourage it um, as a way to start because they need to learn what does this do to their organization. And so I tell them we're looking for pioneering partners, pioneer a site. So do one location with maybe one church partner or a set of supporters and learn how does it impact um, your processes, what can be eliminated, because I know like each organization is very different. Um, and so, and we have had one organization actually that was like, Heather, you're like Airbnb, or Bridgely is like Airbnb, which I was like, well, it's not individual to individual, but um, they said, we're the Marriott. And so why is the Marriott, would we, embrace an Airbnb structure, uh, which was actually it was yeah. a fantastic yeah. question. Yeah. It's like, well, it brings nonprofits into the 21st century. And if you really want to uplift your local program workers, you've got to provide a way for them to have that direct access to their supporters and to share their stories themselves. Um, but yeah, with one child specifically, uh, we've just been slowly migrating 
um, into the one or into the Bridgley system. And so um, we're still learning of what services one child is going to continue to provide. And so on top of Bridgely, they're providing expert services um, that is for an additional cost that um, where they train ministries on how to do uh, child development. So there's still like the programmatic element of training. And then they also work with churches to really train them how to provide a supporter, like ambassador base. Um, yeah, it's but very it's helpful. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I was listening as you talked about the donations. How do you ensure, and I, even saying it makes me uncomfortable, how do you ensure that donations go where they're intended to go? Yeah, I love that question. Um, our, our concept here is that transparency creates accountability. And so when you've got people, let's say that they're giving towards um, clean water wells and you're like, okay, so did it actually happen? They can ask publicly within that environment, say, hey, give me an update if, if they haven't seen one. The, the desire is that Felicia facilitator is in there engaging her supporters and saying, yeah. look, at, yeah. look at these water wells that we've put in and this is amazing. But if there hasn't been one, supporters can hey, say, hey, I haven't heard anything. Can you yeah. tell me how this is going? And so, um, yeah, in Bridgely has a service agreement where we do put in there that um, we need access to the, the audit um, to look. But, but it's really that um, we believe the community will bring the transparency and the accountability. So how do you protect, uh, protect kids against bad actors or protect your frontline workers against bad actors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, I got the Facebook question so many times when leading trips of, can I just be Facebook friends with everybody? And I was like, uh, that's, I can be dangerous. <laughs> um, because there can be inappropriate direct messaging that can happen um, between, yeah, just people that they've even met in country or, yeah, there is that desire of let's keep this godly and keep it honest. And so um, Bridgely provides freedom for frontline facilitators to share their stories directly with the supporting the work they do, but that freedom, it's not a free for all. And so there's an intentional design for community moderation. So there's um, specific roles that can take down content that can block people um, and block them either for just a time or indefinitely um, and let them know why. And so actually that's the ambassador role is able to do that. Um, and then also there's, there's no direct messaging. And so all communication, everybody can see. And so we believe that that helps protect them. But um, there does come a point of, of saying how, how much of the protection is also then creating those policies that make us broker the relationship. And so, and we don't want children like in the app themselves yeah so um they need to not have minors in the app it is that frontline facilitator and if people were concerned of oh well that facilitator could say or show you know pictures of children inappropriately this could go sideways everybody can see it and it can be moderated and taken down yeah yeah and we all run that risk every time we step into a social media platform of stumbling on a picture or something that isn't what we should be looking at and until somebody reports it I'm going to turn to our list of questions that are popping up. Andrew Paris, uh, you're in my top screen. Um, his, his question, or if Andrew, you want to hop on, but uh, do you work with individuals or with organizations on the front line? So do you have to be an organization on the front line, or can you be an individual that's doing poverty alleviation work or um, care for you know, community work? What's that look like? Yeah, it's got to be an organization, not an individual, because Bridgely does not receipt the donation. Um, we do help set up the automatic receipting, but you need to have a 501c3, or if it's for in-country giving, you need to be legally registered in your country um, as a nonprofit. So if it's an organization in Uganda, a local organization, they have to have a registration here in the United States as a 501c3? Yes, if they want to have U.S. donors. 
if they were just fundraising locally, they still they just need to be registered in their own country. And is also asking an interest to hear more about how that frontline facilitator presents his or her work project to potential supporters. Does that get vetted in any way? You know, like how do they do that presentation? Or they do? We we do not dictate how they present it. And so if they want to present it by doing update videos or if they wanted to get more in-depth in post descriptions, then they can they could do that. But yeah, we, we leave that up to them at this point. Zari Gill has a question about, um, and this is a good one, who is the frontline facilitator? So who is Felisa accountable to at the country level? Like who is who is ensuring, you know, um, her protocols and her functioning? Is she she's connected to an organization, presumably, if I understood what you just said? Yes. So um, it looks different for each organization. Um, for one child, it is specifically they are accountable to program directors um, that ever see that in their countries. And then um, for smaller organizations, especially ones that are based in the country that they also are operating out of, um, then it's we leave it up to their the design of their organization that um, that that facilitator on the front line has somebody to to be accountable to for their work and that's why it is it's an organization not a, an individual yeah so the next question is about capacity building so what kinds of support stephanie's asking uh, mm -hmm. training mentorship do you offer organizations that you partner with so that they learn how to develop their presence and their engagement uh, through the app Yes, so that is the um, the LMS side of Bridgely that we are still building out, and so I fundraise for Bridgely, um, and so it's the development side of that of the tech on that has been slower, um, but that is we'll have expert communities where they're on all different topics from child development to education to wash programs, um, where experts can offer their advice and then also get feedback from those that are implementing the work right away. But um, I don't wanna recreate what's already out there in the world. And so I think the key is partnering with networks that do this really well. I see Bridgely as uh, going a long way in helping us break out of the conditioning system that has happened on uh, in the entire circle of um, anti-poverty relationships. Mm -hmm. so, um, really appreciate re what you're doing. So excellent, excellent. Well, I just want to thank you all for being probably one of the most engaged audiences today. This topic has really struck a chord. Um, yeah, yeah. I think for those of us that follow along in the USAID world and the UN world and uh, the philanthropy world, this is the way we must go starting to ask the harder question of how are we really giving agency, not giving, recognizing agency. See, it helped me today even catch my language. Recognizing agency, recognizing voice. Um, to the colleagues around the world that our hearts want to serve, but we want to do it well, and we want to do it in a way that honors the Imago Day in each and every one of them. So I thank you for bringing these great um, thoughts to us today. I'm excited for the future of Bridgely. I have signed the declaration. And I do encourage you all to read it because I know with this audience, I, I know a lot of you, it's going to resonate with your heart. Um, and, and we're going to keep moving forward and we're going to keep figuring this out together uh, so that we truly are working for the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of our own little individual ministry. So, Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. So stay tuned for that. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey, everybody, have a great day.